Um, so it's a great privilege for me to be here. It's a great privilege to be able to introduce to you um, a bit about the International Crisis Group and about our view of uh, the Turkish-Cyprus conflict. Um, <coughs> I'm also very happy here to be here now, of course, while Ireland has the uh, chairmanship of the OSCE. Um, I've been able to meet uh, a series of Irish diplomats over the past few months um, because of your very active involvement in all the non-resolved conflicts in uh, Europe, so in the Balkans, in the Caucasus, um, and in uh, Transnistria, Moldova. So um, I've gotten to know a little bit more about your position and about uh, your um, interest. And of course, what I've been very uh, appreciative of is the great example that Ireland has to provide to the, the rest of Europe concerning the resolution of conflicts and the, the lessons that Ireland could potentially share um, with the Armenians and the Azerbaijanis, or with the Turks and the Cypriots, um, even with the Kosovars and the Serbs. Uh, I think that you have a, you know, a, a very valuable experience, which um, if more people could hear about and learn about and take on board, um, we might be able to move a little bit in resolving uh, these, uh, these conflicts in Europe. <clears throat> Um, so I uh, am the Europe Program Director for the International Crisis Group. I'll just say a few words about ICG. Um, I know that we're not that famous or, or known here in, in Ireland. Um, we are a um, organization that's existed for the past 15 years, and we were developed very much out of the wars in the Balkans, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, um, and in the Great Lake region in Africa. And basically there was a, a series of... Um, political officials, uh, a couple U.S. senators, um, a couple U.N. officials who uh, realized at that time in the mid-1990s that there really wasn't an NGO or a think tank that could provide very quick advice on how to respond to conflict. Um, so there was actually a, a famous plane ride um, flying out of Sarajevo where you had a, a few of these people who, who looked around and said, well, look, uh, why don't we have any advice on, on how to, to resolve this, this thing in Bosnia? Um, we're all kind of scratching our heads. So that's why ICG was created. So it's created very much as an organization to provide policy recommendations and policy advice. Um, so that is what we do. Um, we prepare reports on conflict. We have about between 80 and 90 reports that come out a year uh, on conflicts throughout the world. Um, and each of our reports has recommendations, policy recommendations to governments uh, and international organizations. And in addition to writing these reports, we then go around and do what we call advocacy, which means talking in capitals about um, our findings. Now, what makes us very different from other think tanks is that we are extremely field-based. So all of our reports are written by people that are actually in the field. Um, we have about... 30 offices around the world, um, you know, everywhere, Afghanistan, um, <clears throat> well, we used to have uh, until very recently in Syria, um, we still have somebody going in and out of Syria. Uh, we have or also offices in Africa, in, um, in, um, in uh, South, South America, um, and basically we uh, are, yeah, very much focused on this field-based research. So the advantage that we consider that we have is that we talk to all parties um, in conflict zones. Um, and also, if it is an international conflict, then we also um, talk, to, to talk to the different parties. Um, so for example, a report like this one, the one that I'm going to present to you, the one on Turkey Cyprus, the way that we were able to do that is, of course, doing interviews in, in Nicosia and in Ankara, but then, of course, also interviews uh, in London and Paris in the US um, to get the different views of the parties that are involved in, in this particular issue. Um, we are a quite small organization. Having said that, we're only about 130 staff. Uh, we have about 30 staff which are based in Brussels which do the administrative type things. Um, the president of our organization currently is Louise Arbour, um, the former High Commissioner on Human Rights. Um, and uh, we... Um, yeah, I think that's basically yeah about it. We have our, our, our main so headquarters in Brussels, but we also have advocacy offices in New York uh, to deal with the UN, um, in uh, Washington, in Brussels, obviously, to deal with the EU institutions, in Moscow, and in Beijing. Uh, so those are the what we call advocacy offices, and then we have field offices, as I said, about 30 around the world, um, focusing on the conflicts themselves. 
Um, what I'd like to do during my presentation is really to divide this up into three different parts. Um, first, tell you a little bit about um, Turkey EU, where we are on that today. Um, then to look specifically at Turkey Cyprus and the conflict uh, and the negotiations. And finally, I'll present to you briefly our, our most recent report on the gas fines. Our website uh, is, is quite extensive and you can find all of our reports on the website. So the, this most recent one that came out on Monday on the gas fines is obviously there uh, as well. So, <coughs> sorry, I have a bit of a cold, which I've been dragging around for the past three weeks, so um, sometimes my voice gets a little bit rusty. Um, before, just before I came uh, to the Institute, um, checking on my, on my computer, I'm a big fan of Twitter, and um, I saw a tweet from a, a Turkish uh, academic that um, was quoting the UK Foreign Affairs Committee, um, which obviously somebody in the Foreign Affairs Committee said yesterday that Turkey's EU accession process is stuck um, and is effectively hostage to the Cyprus dispute. And that is, I think, kind of the, the main theme that I'd like to underline today is that Turkey's um, EU accession is very much um, on hold right now. And it is more than anything um, because of the Cyprus dispute. Um, I'm happy to talk about a little bit about Turkey domestic issues if you'd like um, later. Um, there are, of course, a whole host of problems um, in terms of uh, human rights issues and so on in Turkey right now, but really the main problem is the Cypriot dispute. Um, what we also see in Turkey is that there's been a dramatic dec decrease in actual interest in uh, the EU process. So if we look in 2004, polls said um, about 73% of the population was eager to join the European Union. Um, in the most recent poll uh, done by uh, the Marshall Fund, um, only 48% of the population said that they support EU membership. So there, this is a very dramatic decrease. And overall in Turkey, uh, what the sense is that, well, do we really need the European Union anymore? Look at the European Union and its economic crisis. We in Europe, uh, in Turkey, have a booming economy. What, what's the point? Um, I would also say that there's a, a huge kind of political uh, demolarization, a sense that, well, you know, the Europeans don't want us anyway, so why are we fighting for this? So unfortunately, that is very much the feeling in Turkey, um, this, this now decreasing interest in the European Union. And this is for very specific reasons. Um, of course, Turkey is a, a country which is negotiating for membership. Um, Thirteen chapters um, have been opened in the negotiation process. But um, since uh, summer 2010, uh, no new chapters have been opened. Um, only one chapter has actually been closed. Um, and uh, there's only about three or four chapters that can actually currently be opened um, because eight chapters um, are suspended because of the lack of implementation of the Ankara Protocol. Um, the Ankara Protocol was a commitment which Turkey made to open its ports um, and airport to Cyprus. Um, currently, Turkey uh, has all of its, um, uh, all these, the ports and airports and so on closed to Cyprus. Um, Turkey does not recognize uh, the Republic of Cyprus and its current government. Um, so because of this, eight chapters are frozen um, by the European Union. In addition to that, you have six chapters that are fro frozen by the Greek Cypriots and five chapters that are fro frozen by France. Um, so really, uh, as I said, there's only three, three, maximum four chapters that could be open, and there has not been a chapter opened uh, since the summer 2010. So this means that the negotiations technically um, are on hold, um, and it's very difficult to think about how to restart um, these negotiations. Um, there's been a lot of talk about what's going to happen with the, when Cyprus has the EU presidency. Um, Turkey has made different statements. Um, there have been statements where, where Ankara has said, well, that's it, we're not going to talk to Brussels anymore, we're not going to, um, uh, to, to continue with our accession process. Um, but I think that you know, that's really media hype. Um, I actually went to see the, the Turkish ambassador in Brussels um, just last week, and the way he put it to me, he said, quote, um, don't believe the hype. Uh, this is not really going to significantly affect our relations with the European Union as a whole. We will not, um, nego we will not talk with the presidency. Um, we will not go to meetings which are chaired by the presidency. Um, but this uh, will not affect the other types of contacts that we have uh, with the European Union. So, yes, I think that, of course, uh, it will 
be used um, by by politicians and will be used by journalists uh, to to emphasize the fact that Turkey is not going far, uh, is not going fast forward in its EU process. But fundamentally, I don't think it's really going to, to affect uh, the relationship too much. Um, now, as I said, one of the main problems is the fact that Turkey has not implemented uh, the Ankara Protocol. Um, we strongly recommend to the Turkish government to do this. Uh, if the, the Ankara Protocol was implemented, um, then these chapters that have been frozen, the eight ones that have pro been frozen by the European Union would be lifted, this fr freezing would be lifted. So there would be a new energy given to the whole negotiations process. Um, unfortunately, what Turkey says is that its interpretation was that it was given a guarantee that um, in exchange for the Ankara Protocol implementation, the isolation of the Turkish Cypriots would be lifted. Uh, this could mean different things, um, but right now what the Turks are saying is that one, one thing that they would like to see happen is that uh, an airport in, um, in the Turkish uh, side of Cyprus, the airport of Erjan, um, would be open to international traffic. Uh, currently, this airport is an illegal airport. Um, it is not, uh, no planes fly in there except for planes that come from Turkey itself. Um, so that would be one thing that the Turks would like to see happen. The other thing that they would like to see happen is direct trade so that the Turkish Cypriots would be allowed to trade directly uh, with the European Union without going through uh, the other side of the island, without going through the official um, customs and ports and so on of, of the government of Cyprus. Um, now, one thing that is interesting, I think, to underline and, and to, to say, you know, to underline the kind of absurdity of all this is that Turkish Cypriots are EU citizens. Um, they, they are recognized as such as to have and to have the rights of um, EU citizens. But the uh, Aki is suspended on the Turkish side of the Turkish Cypriot side of the island. So they, they kind of live in this this um, how would you say this kind of legal uh, void? Um, uh, many Turkish Cypriots have taken on uh, Greek Cypriot passports, um, so really do act um, like EU citizens and all in, in terms of tra travel and, and so on. Um, now, why? Uh, where are we in terms of the negotiations? Unfortunately, uh, the the negotiations which are mediated by the the well, which are facilitated by the UN. Um, by Representative Downer are really going nowhere. Uh, we were quite optimistic a couple of years ago, and if you go to our past reports, you could see this optimism. But over the past year or so, um, the, the negotiations have really slowed down. Um, the negotiations between uh, the Turkish Cypriots and the Greek Cypriots focus on six main chapters. Um, and in three of the chapters, there has been some progress. So on the chapter on the EU, uh, on governance, and on the economy, there has been some progress, but there has been very little progress on property, security guarantees, and territory. What the Cypriots, the Greek Cypriots and the Turkish Cypriots are trying to do is they are trying to create um, a bi-zono, bi-communal federation. So uh, what they're trying to negotiate is a way to bring the island um, back together giving substantial rights to uh, the Turkish Cypriots, um, but creating a, a federation, so uh, back uh, to a unified uh, state. As we all know, um, there was a previous plan, the Anan plan, um, which the, the Turkish Cypriots voted for and the Greek Cypriots voted against. Um, this, this plan still has a, leaves a certain negative connotation, especially amongst the Greek Cypriots and the Turk, sorry, especially amongst the Turkish Cypriots and the Turks, um, who always <coughs> underlined that they had agreed to this plan. Um, the Greek Cypriots had not, but the Greek Cypriots got um, full uh, EU, EU membership in 2004. So that, that is kind of the, the Turkish argument. Well, why, why uh, should the Turkish Cypriots be um, punished in a certain way? when they voted for uh, reunification. Now, as I said, unfortunately, the talks are going nowhere. Um, on the Turkish Cypriot side, um, there was the election of a new president or de facto president in 2010, uh, Mr. Erolu, who tends to be more conservative. Um, on the Greek Cypriot side, President Christofias has been a very long time uh, commitment to reunification. Um, he will have elections um, soon as well. 
Um, and to be honest, he is also, you know, starting to become in a campaign mode uh, for elections in early, in 2013. And obviously, the the uh, Cyprus will be very much focused on its EU presidency during the second half of the year. So we personally do not expect much progress in the negotiations because obviously um, Cyprus will be involved first in the EU and then win its own elections. So it's going to be very difficult um, to get much movement on these talks in the next 18 months or so. Um, so that then puts us in a very precarious environment for a big gas find. Um, what has happened is that the uh, gas has been found um, off the coast of the south um, of uh, Greek Cyprus. So you can see it there. It's the Aphrodite. Um, I assume there's probably a thing, but I'll just show you. There's the Aphrodite gas line, which is right here, which is really um, on the border, almost on the border between Cyprus and the Israeli uh, uh, area. Um, the Levithian and the Tamar gas field are two other very big gas fields, which are um, now being developed by Israel. <coughs> Aphrodite is mainly uh, a Cypriot find, uh, but the Israelis are also participating um, in, in part, of its, part of its development. Now, this um, gas find is supposed to have approximately between 140 and 220 billion cubic meters. Um, so the expectation is that it would be able to provide gas for at least um, 10 years. And it is, it is just the first find. So it was discovered in fall 2011. Um, a US-based uh, energy company, Noble, is the one that's developing it now currently. And as you can see, that there are 12 other research blocks that have been defined. And Cyprus has now put those up for, for licensing. And by May, um, companies should provide their bids to, uh, to explore in those blocks. Nobody knows, really, what, what's going to be found. There's a potential for a lot more but that's really still um, to be seen. Now, um, when this uh, find was declared and um, the Turkish reaction was extremely uh, hostile to this, <coughs> what Turkey is arguing is that any gas finds um, off the, the coast of Cyprus should belong to both communities in Cyprus. Um, that any uh, that natural resources have been agreed by the two parties to belong to both communities, and that really there should be no unilateral uh, exploitation of any natural resources. What the uh, the government of Cyprus has said, or the president of Cyprus has said, is that of course um, the Turkish Cypriots will be able to benefit from this fine as well um, in the long term. Um, and what we are recommending uh, in our report is that you know this be codified and that basically there be a committee set up between the Greek Cypriots and the Turkish Cypriots to discuss together energy development and that 20% um, of any profits made um, with this oil find, a gas find or other gas finds be shared also uh, with the Turkish Cypriots. Um, so far, uh, as I said, the Greek Cypriots have kind of pledged this in an oral way, but haven't actually done anything um, specifically to, to set up this kind of committee or to uh, set up a, a distribution mechanism. Um, the, uh, the, the Turkish uh, side um, has went even further. It wasn't only verbal uh, criticism, but also has sent out ships to investigate uh, close uh, to the uh, Aphrodite um, drill and basically has thus been threatening with these kind of very hostile maneuvers, uh, not doing anything actually. Um, and as we've heard from Ankara, they don't, they've told us we don't want to get physical, uh, but they've shown their presence um, close to, the, to, these, to this um, development. They've also stated that any um, firm, gas firm, which is working in, in, in this area will not be welcome in Turkey. So some of the majors um, that ha are already working in Turkey um, are clearly put off that and they're clearly not interested in working in the East Mediterranean 
um, because of those Turkish threats. Uh, for example, I just recently spoke to Stat Oil. Um, Stat Oil works a lot um, in Turkey, and that's a company which, um, you know, is involved very much in the region, but is not going to get involved in the East Mediterranean because of this um, political uh, dispute. Um, and Turkey has even gone further and now made agreements with the Turkish Cypriot side to develop gas um, in the area that they consider to be off the coast of, of Turkish Cyprus. Now, it's not visible on this map, but there is an overlap in what um, the Turks are claiming is that the Turkish Cypriots um, also ha are entitled to, to uh, develop kind of like around here. So there are overlapping parts of which potentially could be extremely conflictual. So you could find um, the, Turk, the Turks drilling in area which they consider to be Turkish Cypriot and the Greek Cypriots consider to be Greek Cypriot. So um, that is one of the, the key conflicts. Another key conflict is a dispute over um, continental shelf. So the, not having to do with Cyprus, but actually having to do with Turkey itself. Um, as you can see here, Turkey claims that its continental shelf goes all the way out to here, which overlaps parts of uh, what uh, Greek Cyprus, um, or what uh, Cyprus is now developing uh, in its most recent licensing um, call. So the situation is extremely complex because there's disputes over continental shelf, over the EEZs, um, and actually over who would get the profits once, they're, once they come out of the ground. Um, what we've recommended, besides the fact of setting up a sharing mechanism and a, a way for the Greek Cypriots and Turkish <coughs> Cypriots to talk about the gas, um, we have also asked, well, what's going to happen to this gas once it gets out of the ground? Um, obviously, uh, the amounts are quite big, um, so th this is amount that could be exported to the European Union uh, and, of course, beyond Cyprus itself. Um, what, what Noble is thinking of doing, so the, the U.S. firm which is, exploit, which is drilling right now, is to bring the gas onto Cyprus itself, onto the mainland. But then where is the gas going to go is the, is the main question. There's basically two competing projects. One is an LNG uh, plant to make liquefied gas out of this, um, which would have the advantage of being able to export to Asian markets where gas is more expensive. But an LNG plant costs a fortune. I mean, it costs something like five billion, uh, at least five billion uh, dollars uh, to develop. So the other possibility would be to transport it by pipeline. W one could transport it to Israel, but then how do you get it out of Israel? I mean, obviously, with all the conflict now going on in the Middle East, sending it up through Lebanon into Syria is a very you know politically sensitive um, project. And some what some people on Cyprus would like to do is to to do a pipeline all the way to Greece. Um, but our understanding, talking to energy experts, is that this would be, first of all, I mean, a huge pipeline. Um, it would be extremely expensive, not only because of the distance, but also because the seabed is, is very um, uh, very hard to work with um, in the East Mediterranean. So what we're proposing is that a pipeline be um, built between Cyprus and Turkey itself. Um, obviously, once the gas gets into Turkey, and then there would be good uh, possibilities to transport it onto the European Union. There are several big pipeline projects now uh, on the drawing board to get gas to the European Union, um, and those uh, there should be a quick decision actually on which pipeline is going to be built. So there would potentially be spare capacity to use the, the Turkish pipeline network to get gas uh, to the European Union. Now, of course, our proposal to build this pipeline, uh, kind of peace pipeline, um, is very difficult um, to implement because, as I said, at this point, um, Turkey does not even recognize uh, the Republic of Cyprus and refuses to actually talk to government officials um, from Nicosia. So um, our, our recommendation is that um, Turkey lifts this um, refusal to dialogue and that a, a discussion start. Um, even if there is not an agreement on how to resolve the Cyprus problem, it is important that Turkey and Cyprus share this uh, transportation of these gas fines and discuss this. 
Um, otherwise, we are quite worried about the, you know, the increase of conflict in the East Mediterranean. Um, as I said, at this point, the Turks don't want to get physical, but there is a whole host of conflicts uh, that could potentially lead to something quite, uh, quite dangerous. So I think I'll leave it at that for now. Um, I